Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us the APS CJCS 2020 webinar seven. Ah, that's okay. Uh, hypertension guidelines and future practice in Asia. I'm Naoyuki Hasebe from uh, Sahikawa, Japan. I will chair uh, this session together with uh, great professor Ji uh, Guan Wan from Shanghai, China. Uh, it's uh, uh, our great pleasure and honor to organize this session despite the many difficulties uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, today we have distinguished speakers for this session, uh, Professor Shang Ha Park from Korea, thank you for coming, and Professor Chang Da Wan from Taiwan, uh, unfortunately he is not present today, but his uh, recorded uh, presentation uh, is here so we can enjoy that. Uh, so that won't be a problem. And the Professor uh, Mitsuru o uh, Oishi from Kagoshima, uh, Japan. Thank you for coming. Uh, we hope everybody enjoyed this 90 minute session on hypertension management in Asia. Uh, so let's start the session. At the beginning, I will give you a brief uh, talk as an introduction. Uh, oh, um, <clears throat> overview of hypertension in Asia. Uh, at two, oh, this is my COR. At, at 2,000, 972 million people were hypertensive worldwide. Uh, it was estimated to increase to uh, 1.56 billion at 2225. A switching of dominant sex in hypertension from men in 2000 to women in 2025 may reflect the longevity of women. Uh, one third of patients live in developed countries and the, re the remaining two third uh, live in developing countries. According to uh, uh, WHO Global Health Observatory data 2015, uh, raised blood pressure is estimated to cause 7.5 million deaths. About 12.8% of the total of all deaths worldwide. Uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease doubles for each increment of 20 over 10 millimeter mercury of blood pressure are starting as low as 115 over 75 millimeter mercury. Across the WHO regions, the prevalence of raised blood pressure was highest in Africa, uh, where it was 46% for both sexes combined. And this map shows a distribution of raised blood pressure in female worldwide. And the higher prevalence shown in red or dark orange indicate the prevalence is prominent in Africa and Eurasia. Uh, here is uh, Yemen and uh, Afghanistan. In May, the prevalence of hypertension is more marked in Africa and the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, here is uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan in Asia. Uh, this map shows those of both sexes combined. The number of adults with hypertension were 1.13 billion in worldwide in uh, 2015. 258 million, 23% uh, uh, live in South Asia, mainly in India, and 230. 5 million, 21% live in Asia, uh, East Asia, mainly in uh, China. Uh, hypertension is the most uh, influential factor contributing to cardiovascular deaths in Japan. And the annual number of deaths due to hypertension was estimated to uh, 100,000 which was twice or three times 
uh, greater than other factors, physical inactivity, smoking, hyperglycemia, and high LDL cholesterol levels. Uh, cardiovascular death rates for coronary heart disease uh, were greater than those for stroke in uh, many Asian countries. Uh, in Western Asia, for example, in blue, uh, like uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, in Central Asia, in pink, uh, like uh, Uzbekistan, and in Middle East Asia, in light green, uh, like Iran, and in Southeast Asia in orange, like uh, Indonesia. In contrast, uh, those for uh, stroke were dominant in Korea and Japan and China, uh, shown in red. So accordingly, when the greater stroke mortality in, in excess of coronary heart disease mortality is expressed in red or dark orange areas. Uh, those were uh, prominent in China, uh, Mongolia, and Thailand, Korea, and Japan. Uh, there were a strong positive association of blood pressure with total cardiovascular deaths in Asia and Australasia. Uh, particularly, the relation was uh, significantly steeper in Asia. The lower panel of bar charts showed the content of events. Uh, the major event was stroke in Asia shown in light blue. And in contrast, uh, it was ischemic heart disease in Australasia shown in pink. It shows a typical uh, contrast. Uh, even within Asia, uh, there are marked differences in hypertension awareness treatment and control rates uh, between countries. For example, the control rates were ranging from 5.5 to 70 percent. Diversity of genetic background, culture, lifestyle, uh, environment, and so on contribute to the heterogeneity. Uh, despite uh, remarkable advances in the diagnosis and treatment of hypertension, uh, countermeasures against hypertension are still insufficient. The ratio of unaware and untreated uh, patient with hypertension was 33%. Therefore, the estimated awareness ratio of hypertension uh, is 67% in Japan. The ratio uh, I estimated, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Treated uh, ratio of hypertension was barely more than half, 56% in Japan. Uh, out of 43 million patients with hypertension, uh, only 12 million, uh, that means only 27% of patients have hypertension well controlled. This hypertension paradox uh, is a serious clinical problem in, in Japan. Here is the classification of blood pressure levels in adults in Japanese Society of Hypertension GSH uh, guideline 2019. Uh, hypertension is defined as office blood pressure more than 140 over 90 millimeter mercury. Uh, which was same as the previous guideline, GSH 2014. Normal blood pressure was defined less than one, uh, 120 over 80 millimeter mercury, and normal and high normal pressure were categorized in normal range. So between both categories, elevated blood pressure range is identified neither normal nor hypertension, but pre-hypertension range. A diagnostic threshold for hypertension is more than 140, 90 millimeter mercury in, in almost uh, all countries in Asia. As for the target level of blood pressure control, some countries uh, recommend a lower threshold, less than 130 over 80 millimeter mercury, 
consistent with the European and US guidelines. The US guidelines recommend the same uh, blood pressure target for all uh, patients with hypertension regardless of comorbidities. Uh, in contrast to the US guideline, uh, many Asian countries recommend a different uh, target blood pressure depending on the comorbidity and the risk profile, for example, diabetes and uh, CKD. When we adopt uh, lower uh, target blood pressure levels, the ratio of well-controlled patients consequently decreased further. Uh, this is a new logo mark recently selected by Japanese Society of Hypertension uh, to facilitate good control of hypertension for achieving blood pressure control levels less than 130 80 millimeter mercury. The effects of antihypertensive treatment on cardiovascular disease depend mainly on the degree of blood pressure reduction rather than the class of antihypertensive drug. In Eastern Asia, CCBs and the ARBs are widely used as a first-line drug in most countries. The combination therapy is often required to achieve blood pressure control. Thus, use of monotherapy is around 40% on average. Asians have an unfavorable tendency of high salt intake. Uh, which combined with uh, greater uh, salt sensitivity in Asians than in Caucasians. Uh, this figure is from British Medical Journal indicating high sodium intake in Asian countries. In the left panel, Asian countries were highlighted by red squares. And in the light map, the countries reported the high sodium intake shown in red and orange, dark orange areas, including Japan. This is a mascot character for salt restriction campaign in Japan. His name is Yoshio-kun, uh, meaning good salt in Japanese. He's six years old and six is associated with the goal of salt restriction less than six grams per day. He put on a measuring spoon as a cap and is always measuring his blood pressure, symbolizing the highly awareness of hypertension. Uh, the sign indicated uh, 17th of every month is enacted as salt restriction day by Japanese Society of Hypertension. Uh, for prevention of hypertension, lifestyle modification is unquestionably important. So reduction less than six grams per day and increase in vegetable fruit and fish intake and decrease in cholesterol and saturated fatty acid and body weight control and exercise uh, reduction of alcohol intake and smoking cessations are all strongly recommended. The valid factors contributing to hypertension and cardiovascular disease in Asia are summarized in this figure. Uh, diversity of genetic background, uh, culture, urbanization, and environment, lifestyle-related disorders and comorbidities are all contribute to the heterogeneity of hypertension in Asia. Thus, we need to share our knowledge and information to facilitate best practice for the effective management of hypertension and prevention of cardiovascular disease. Uh, that's all for introduction and thank you for your attention. Uh, let's uh, start the session. I move on to the first speaker, uh, Professor Jigan Wan from Shanghai, China. Uh, the title of his talk today uh, is uh, current and future hypertension guideline in China. Uh, Professor Wang, please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to give a presentation in this uh, symposium. My name is Ji Guang Wang from the Shanghai Institute of Hypertension. I should thank the organizers of the meeting to give this opportunity for me 
to present the Chinese hypertension guideline. That's my disclosures. The most recent Chinese hypertension guideline was published in 2018, both in the Chinese language and in English. In these uh, 2018 Chinese hypertension guidelines, uh, we did not redefine hypertension. As you may see here in this uh, slide, we can see uh, the details of the uh, blood pressure classification in these new Chinese hypertension guidelines. We classify normal blood pressure in two different levels and uh, hypertension in three uh, stages. This is different from the uh, recent uh, American hypertension guidelines. You are all aware that uh, in the American hypertension guidelines, they redefined hypertension as uh, 130 or 80. So it means that they changed the previous definition of 140 over 90 to uh, the new threshold 130 over 80. However, in the Chinese hypertension guidelines, we also recommend the use of uh, all of office blood pressure measurements. As you may see here, we recommend the use of ambulatory and home blood pressure monitoring to define hypertension. So in this regard, we have uh, similarities as most of the uh, hypertension guidelines, the uh, American guidelines and the European hypertension guidelines uh, also published in 2018. Chinese hypertension guidelines, we continued uh, these uh, cardiovascular risk assessments and stratification according to both systolic and diastolic blood pressure and cardiovascular risk factors and complications. On the left hand, you see those risk factors and uh, uh, complications. On the uh, horizontal axis, we have different levels of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. One of the uh, new uh, uh, recommendations is uh, on the uh, uh, left column of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So it means that uh, we would also treat those people with uh, a slightly lower systolic or diastolic blood pressure below 140 over 90 if a patient uh, would have a higher cardiovascular risk. Chinese hypertension guidelines, uh, we continued uh, recommending uh, various uh, blood pressure target of treatment according to age. As you can see here, in general, we treat to 140 over 90 or uh, 130 over 80 as an intensive uh, blood pressure target. But in those older than 65 years, especially those older than 80 years, uh, we treat uh, to a less stringent uh, target. Uh, here you see 150 over 90 millimeter of mercury. And in those uh, uh, between 65 uh, and 79, and we can also treat to 140 over 90 if tolerable. Choice of uh, antihypertensive drugs. Chinese hypertension guideline recommends uh, five classes of antihypertensive drugs as a primary agent, or in other words, a first line agent for uh, antihypertensive treatment. And the difference is uh, about uh, the use of beta blockers. Here you see in these Chinese hypertension guidelines, we continue recommending the use of uh, beta blockers uh, as a primary agent of antihypertensive treatment. For the choice of a combination therapy, the Chinese hypertension guidelines uh, have a little bit different recommendations from other hypertension guidelines. Here you can see we recommend similarly as other hypertension guidelines, the combination of calcium channel blocker with a eastern inhibitor up or a size diuretic with a eastern inhibitor up. But in addition, in this uh, Chinese hypertension guidelines, we also recommend the combination of a calcium channel blocker with a size diuretic or beta blocker. 
as a preferred combination. Then we can compare the child star position guidelines 2018 with the very recently published uh, International Society of Hypertension Guidelines, the so-called ISH 2020. So here we uh, uh, can compare various characteristics of uh, these two different guidelines. Uh, you see, these two guidelines have a lot of similarities, but they uh, do have uh, quite different recommendations, for instance, in the blood pressure classification. And another major difference is uh, the choice of uh, uh, initial drug treatment and uh, for both uh, monotherapy and for combination therapy. As you may see here, the uh, uh, International Society of Hypertension Guidelines recommends uh, early use of single pill combination therapy, especially the combination of a calcium channel blocker with an ACE inhibitor or R. The target, the two guidelines are also uh, slightly different. In general, the Chinese hypertension guideline is uh, a little bit conservative in uh, the uh, uh, therapeutic target. Here you can see uh, in the elderly, uh, uh, younger or older elderly, and we uh, tend to uh, recommend a less stringent therapeutic target, but uh, in the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines, they recommend 130 over 80 in general and uh, 140 over 90 in uh, those elderly uh, hypertensive patients. If we would consider the International Society of Hypertension Guidelines as a background for the future joint hypertension guidelines, how we are going to uh, uh, develop a new hypertension guidelines in China. And in this and uh, next few slides, I would present uh, some personal ideas uh, myself. So uh, if you uh, look at uh, blood pressure classification on the basis of clinic measurements. Here you can see my personal view is to simplify the classification according to a clinic blood pressure. I would uh, be in favor of uh, two levels of normal blood pressure, normal and high normal, and two levels of stage one and stage two high tension. So I personally uh, prefer to uh, define severe hypertension in those people with a systolic blood pressure of 180 or higher, or a diastolic blood pressure 110 or higher. In the meantime, I would be in favor of using an uh, automated clinical blood pressure measurement. Here you can see uh, we uh, recently established uh, infrastructure for blood pressure measurement in our outpatient clinic, the patients uh, measure blood pressure themselves, and the uh, blood pressure readings would be automatically transmitted to the uh, hospital information system, and the doctors uh, can look at uh, those blood pressure readings when they see the patient. We probably have to rely more on ambient blood pressure measurement uh, in the diagnosis of hypertension. Uh, you can see from this slide, we can actually classify blood pressure according to ambulance blood pressure measurement. And we compared uh, outcome-driven thresholds with uh, the uh, threshold recommended by the American Hypertension Guidelines. And uh, you can see here, they are slightly different. Uh, this slide is a little bit uh, busy and complex. Uh, I would have to explain to you uh, carefully. On the left hand, you have home blood pressure. On the right hand, in three panels, you have ambient blood pressure. On the very right hand, you have actually the 24-hour blood pressure. Here you see is the association between systolic blood pressure and the risk of uh, cardiovascular events in four different age groups. On the bottom, you have uh, those people younger than 60 years. On the upper part, you have three older age groups. And the association is uh, much stronger in those younger than 60 years than uh, the three older age groups. 
Home blood pressure monitoring is similarly important as ambulance blood pressure monitoring. Uh, we recently published the 2019 Chinese Hypertension League Home blood pressure monitoring guidelines. As you may see here, we recommend the use of home blood pressure to define hypertension. And here we can uh, find uh, those people with uh, the so-called white coat hypertension and those with masked hypertension. In the new Chinese hypertension guidelines, we probably also have more recommendations on screening for uh, the so-called secondary hypertension. As you may see at uh, the scheme uh, from the American hypertension guidelines, they recommend it. Uh, those people with new onset or uncontrolled hypertension uh, for the uh, secondary hypertension screen, if they have uh, the uh, conditions listed uh, in this uh, box. So uh, in the new chance hypertension guidelines, we probably will have to do the same thing to uh, screen those people with secondary hypertension. In addition, we probably should also look after those uh, emerging diseases, for instance, atrial fibrillation. We are living in an aging world. We have more and more people over uh, 60 years, or even 80 or 90 years. And atrial fibrillation is a very typical age-dependent disease. Only in those uh, people over 65 or 75 years, uh, you would see a higher prevalence of atrial fibrillation. So uh, we probably uh, have to uh, do more research uh, in uh, patients with both hypertension and atrial fibrillation. And in the meantime, we probably need also recommendations uh, for this uh, special group of patients with uh, the two diseases, hypertension and atrial fibrillation. Finally, I would say a few words on the general principles of the new Chinese hypertension guidelines. The new guidelines to be goal driven, so we have to focus on blood pressure control. We set up a new goal for 2030 and we want to uh, improve blood pressure control rate from the current uh, 15 to 16 percent to uh, 50 percent by 2030. Second, the new guidelines uh, has to be uh, technology uh, led, so we have to uh, recommend the use of uh, new technology, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence or telemedicine. And the third, we have to balance idealism and practicability. So uh, the guideline has to be ideal, but has to be practical as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, so uh, we will have the next Speaker's presentation, Professor uh, Shang Park uh, from Korea. Uh, the title of uh, his talk today is Big Data of Hypertension Practice in Korea. Uh, Professor Park, please. Oh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, can you all see my slides? Yes, I can okay. see. That's good. Okay. So uh, the presentation, my presentation will be uh, Big Data of Hypertension Practice in Korea. Yeah, these are my disclosures. Uh, and first off, I would like to introduce uh, the Korean Hypertension Fact Sheet 2018. Uh, this was a, a fact, fact sheet of uh, Korea that was developed by uh, the Korean Society of Hypertension. It is based on uh, two of the big data uh, databases in Korea. One is the, the Korean National Health Examination Database. And another is uh, the Korean National Health Insurance database. Uh, in Korea, uh, it's a single payer system, health insurance system. So the government opens the database to researchers uh, for uh, analysis and research. So the Korean National Health Examination started in 1998. 
And from this database, uh, the, the, the Korean Society of Hypertension defined hypertension as blood pressure over 140 over 90 during the examination or history of taking uh, any hypertensive medication. Uh, awareness was uh, defined as subjects who satisfied the definition of hypertension and also who received the diagnosis of hypertension from a physician. Uh, treatment rate was defined as subjects with hypertension who received at least 20 days of prescription per month of antihypertensive medication. Uh, definition of hypertension control was defined as uh, treated subjects who had blood pressure under 140 of 90 at the follow up uh, health examination. Okay, so for the uh, Korean National Health Insurance uh, Corporation database, uh, the database is, was available from 2002 to 2016. Uh, the diagnosis of hypertension uh, was uh, defined as uh, subjects who went to see a medical professional at least once a year with a diagnosis of hypertension. And treatment was defined as subjects who received at least one prescription uh, a year for antihypertensive medications. Compliance was defined as subjects who received prescription for at least 80% uh, per year. And the medications are defined as uh, follows. So uh, when you look at the changes in the average blood pressure over time, uh, these were subjects over the age of 30. Uh, in 1998, the average blood pressure, uh, which you see in purple, was 128 over 80, which has declined over the years to 118 over 77. So overall, in the population, you see a decline in the average blood pressure. Uh, the tr you look at the pre uh, trends in the prevalence of hypertension. This was a uh, um, age standardized, and you can see that the prevalence was similar to the prevalence that uh, that was shown overall in the Asian population. Uh, you can see it's around 29 percent. But what's interesting is that the prevalence of hypertension has slightly increased over the years in males, uh, while it has uh, shown a decrease in females. This is an interesting data. Uh, and so the overall prevalence has not changed over the past uh, 18 years. I think we're not doing a very good job uh, in preventing hypertension through uh, lifestyle modification. And when you look at the treatment rate overall, it's also similar to the overall data in Japan. It's also age standardized. You can see that uh, the treatment rate for males is about 60%, and in females, it's about 64%. You can see that since 2007, uh, the, the, the treatment rate has plateaued uh, for females, while there was a slight improvement in males, male population. Also, you can see the overall treatment control rate. Uh, overall, in females, the control rate is about 47%, and in males, it's about 43%. And also, you can see for females, it has plateaued since 2007, but for males, there was a slight improvement uh, from about 38% to 43%. And when you look at the control rate among treated patients, treated hypertensive patients, it was around 71% for males and 71% for females. Again, uh, although there's a vast improvement since 1998, uh, it has somewhat plateaued since 2007, and I think overall we need to do a better job of improving this, uh, this number. This was another data. Um, uh, this was a, an analysis of the uh, National Health Insurance Database from 2013 to 2015. Uh, the analysis was done on 5,100 hypertensive patients who underwent the Korean National Health Examination. And what I want to emphasize is uh, you, when you look at the, the data in subjects with young age hypertension, uh, the treatment rate is very poor. And I, I'm sure it's the sim, uh, similar phenomenon in other countries. For you can see for all hypertensives, when you look at the treatment, the control rate for uh, males uh, for between the age of 30 to 39, it's only about 9.7%. And in women, it's only about 11.1%. So we are doing a very poor job of uh, controlling hypertension in these uh, young age population. 
Okay, so when you look at the male population, uh, uh, between the age of 40 to 49 in males, the overall control rate is only about 22%. So these, uh, these population, these young age populations are the population that we need to target to improve the overall control rate. Because uh, the data from Korea shows that in young age population, the elevated blood pressure uh, increases cardiovascular events. Uh, this was a recently published paper. Uh, what uh, the authors analyzed um, the Korean National Health Insurance Database. What they uh, the Korean National Health Insurance Database has a separate uh, database for health uh, examination in Korea. Uh, the population are uh, the, a health examination is sponsored by the government, and the population are allowed to have examination every two years. And so, the, so there's a database for this. And in this database, they uh, analyze the database from who uh, for population who received health examination between 2002 to 2003 and 2004 to 2005. So there was about 2.4 million. Uh, subjects between the age of 20 to 39 who underwent health examination. And they uh, uh, assessed the cardiovascular events according to the baseline uh, blood pressure. And what they found was that when they categorized the blood pressure according to the 2017 ACC AHA guideline, they found that in these, these young populations, uh, in male and female, those of a blood pressure above 130 over 80 had increase in cardiovascular events. And also there was a graded increase in cardiovascular events with more increased cardiovascular events in those with stage two hypertension or blood pressure over 140 over 90. And what is very interesting is that in those subjects with baseline blood pressure, in those who did not go uh, receive any antihypertensive medication, when you, got, when you look at the spline curve, there's a very steep increase in cardiovascular events with increase in blood pressure. But in those subjects who received antihypertensive medication after baseline examination, you can see that there was a very decreased uh, uh, events in cardiovascular events. And you can see very strong attenuation of these hazard ratios. So it, I think you, you can see from these data that uh, these young subjects who receive cardiovascular antihypertensive medications have reduced cardiovascular events and blood pressure treatment in these young subjects is essential for the entire population health. And I think we need to do a better job both in Korea and the Asian Pacific uh, region uh, to target these young age hypertensive uh, patients. Okay, and this was an, another recent paper uh, uh, that was published in circulation and what this paper looked at was also it looked at the, the young age population between 20 to 39. And they looked at the data of subjects who received the national health examination between 2003 and 2007. And they also looked at whether or not isolated systolic hypertension in the young and the isolated diastolic hypertension in the young have uh, increased prognosis because some data have suggested that the isolated systolic hypertension in the young is, is a benign disease. But what we found was that in subjects who have uh, isolated systolic hypertension in the young, the prognosis is there's an increased risk of cardiovascular events. And you can see from this data that, of course, those who have uh, stage two systolic and diastolic hypertension have the worst prognosis. When you look at it, uh, you can see that those who have isolated systolic hypertension stage two or subjects who have isolated SPP above 140 over 90 have uh, increased uh, cardiovascular events compared to those with elevated blood pressure. And there was a, 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 a you can see for the next uh, subjects who have the worst prognosis were those with stage one systolic and diastolic hypertension. And what was very interesting was that in those with stage one isolated systolic hypertension and isolated diastolic hypertension, there was also an increased risk of cardiovascular events compared to those with normal blood pressure. So you can see that even in subjects who have uh, isolated systolic and diastolic hyper uh, hypertension above uh, systolic blood pressure over 130 over, or diastolic hypertension over 80, there's an increased risk of cardiovascular events and we need to do a, a very uh, more better job uh, to control blood pressure in these uh, 
young subjects. And also, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, analyze the National Health Insurance Service da database. What we looked at was, we looked at uh, low risk stage one hypertensive patients uh, who had less than uh, two, less than two uh, associated risk factors and those who did not have any uh, cardiovascular disease at baseline. And we looked at the, the cardiovascular outcomes and ESRD according to whether or not these patients had controlled blood pressure or uncontrolled blood pressure during a median follow-up of about 10 years. And what we found was that there was a uh, significant reduction in uh, stroke, mortality, and in-stage renal disease in those who had controlled blood pressure below 140 or 90 in this relatively young, uh, relatively low-risk hypertension. And what we found also was that subjects who had the average uh, mean blood pressure between systolic blood pressure 120 to 130 and diastolic blood pressure between 70 to 80 has had the lowest risk of all-cause mortality, uh, suggesting that uh, even in these uh, low-risk stage one hypertension, I guess the, the optimal blood pressure is below 130 over 80 in terms of uh, mortality reduction. And also when we did a interaction analysis according to age, we found that for mortality, stroke, and in-stage in renal disease, even in subjects who, had, uh, who were young, below, below age 50, uh, there wasn't any significant interaction. In other words, uh, control blood pressure improved outcome in these uh, uh, young age stage one hypertensive subjects. Uh, and lastly, I want to show you the prescription pattern uh, in Korea, according to the big data. About 60% uh, of the patients were prescribed with two or more drugs and 40% uh, were prescribed monotherapy. I think the data was similar to what was shown for China and Japan. I guess uh, this, we need to do a more better job, I think, of prescribing combination drug treatments to improve uh, the blood pressure control rate. And also the most highly pre prescribed uh, medication uh, is our ARBs, ARBs, followed by CCBs. And I, can, I think you can see, see that uh, we need to do a more better job of increasing the uh, prescription of diuretics. Uh, the diuretics are very, uh, the prescription rate is very low. And I think similar to other uh, countries in Asia is that uh, due to the, uh, the side effects of dry coughing, uh, AC inhibitors are uh, highly prescribed uh, for uh, hypertension. And also the most highly prescribed uh, combination uh, treatment is CCB plus uh, ARBs. It's almost two to one uh, compared to ARB and diuretic combinations. Uh, comorbidities, uh, I think this is an interesting finding. Among the treated diabetic patients, 63% have concomitant hypertension. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you are aware that diabetics who have hypertension have a uh, very high risk for cardiovascular events. So uh, this is a very interesting finding. And among the uh, 8.2 million treated hypertensive patients of the age, above the age of 30, one quarter of them also have diabetes. So it is a very uh, common conditions that are commonly, co uh, commonly associated with each other. So in conclusion, uh, in Korean adults above the age of 30, uh, the prevalence of hypertension is around 29%. And the awareness, the treatment rate, and control rate um, among the treated uh, was 65%, 61%, 71%, and 44% respectively. Okay, so, and more than about 60% of hypertensive subjects were treated with two or more drugs. I think we need to do a more better job to improve the control rate. And about 63% of diabetics were treated for hypertension and about 25% of hypertensive had diabetes. And also the data show that there was increased cardiovascular events in young adults between the age of 20 to 39 at blood pressure above 130 over 80. And they had extremely poor control rate overall, just only about 10% in the population. And I think this is a population that we need to target to improve the uh, cardiovascular event uh, rate in the overall population. And also the control BP below 130 over 80 was associated with the lowest risk of mortality. And I think the national effort to improve the control rate in the younger population uh, is imperative. Uh, thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Professor Warren. Uh, no, Professor Park. Thank you very <laughs> much. Uh, that was a very impressive uh, presentation. According to the uh, Korean big data, we, we understand the, the, your point. And uh, uh, we, uh, yeah, I'm very impressed by the, your powerful approach for uh, young adult hypertension, stage one hypertension. That's a very uh, new uh, point we, we should uh, focus on next time. And uh, you think the because of the young subject, we, uh, when we get the result, for the prospective study or prospective uh, examination, uh, we take a longer time to get the results. So, what, what do you think about the the the, the, the prospective uh, you, you, you future, future <laughs> perspectives? Random, random studies. Yes. Yeah, I think that's that's the biggest problem because uh, because they take such a long time to get. Uh, the necessary cardiovascular events. Uh, mm. We will need so many uh, patients and uh, a long duration. And I think the funding will be almost impossible to do. So I, th I think it's uh, very difficult to do a, a clinical randomized studies in these young patients. I think but we have to, in these cases, derive information from these big data. Mm. I think uh, overall, I, these the control blood pressure in these uh, young population may in the long run, increased cardiovascular events, but it, I think more data is showing that it, it is very highly associated with also heart failure and dementia. No. I think uh, I think a control of blood pressure in these populations is is, is a very mm. important uh, topic to uh, to mm. uh, tackle. Mm. Yeah, can I can I ask you a question about uh, a uh, possible uh, cluster randomized uh, study within your national uh, health insurance system. If you have such a database, uh, is it possible to, uh, for instance, randomize uh, general practitioners or hospitals uh, to manage uh, blood pressure in two different levels? <laughs> that sounds like a great idea, but we have to, uh, we have to uh, get the government involved, I guess. <laughs> it's very difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's another problem. That uh, <laughs> you, uh, I understand you use uh, double combination of uh, antihypertensive drugs mainly, uh, but uh, you sometimes use a triple combination drugs, and your graph shows some uh, uh, increasing in the triple combination of. Uh, your uh, antihypertensive drugs in Korea, uh, am, am I right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is increasing now. We, uh, uh -huh. So in it, Korea, it, I, it's yeah. a combined tablet, uh, and you, you are talking about the three different drugs or the one tablet combined three. Right, so, uh, yeah, so the data doesn't show whether or not it's a, it's a fixed uh -huh. combination or, or, or uh -huh. uh, yeah, separate combination, uh -huh. but uh, the data currently shows it's about 50 to 50, uh -huh. and I think the fixed combination is increasing, uh -huh. and with regards to the triple combination, there are some, the, the, there's increase in the fixed dose combination for the triple combination, and I think the, the prescription rate right now is increasing. But uh, for the uh, analysis of the, the, the big data, we cannot discern whether or not it's a single pill combination or a triple combination uh, or a fixed dose combination or a separate combination. So, uh, but some, some of the data from Korea shows that it's about 50 to 50. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we should consider the order of the presentation, but uh, uh, how can we manage uh, the professor uh, one from Taiwan, the, his presentation is re already decoded, so we can enjoy that soon. But uh, we need uh, more time for Professor Wan in China. China. Wan, oh, it's, it's disconnected again. It's what? Dear Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, it's my great honor to be invited to present in the Asian Pacific Society of Cardiology meeting. I'm Dr. Zona Wang from National Taiwan University Hospital. I'm also the current president of Taiwan Hypertension Society. The talk I will give today entitled Current and Future Hypertension Guidelines in Taiwan. I will introduce you first, the current status of hypertension control in Taiwan, and second, the key features of 2015 and 2017 Taiwan Hypertension Guidelines, and finally, new findings or new recommendations of the upcoming Taiwan Hypertension Guideline, which is in preparation and will be published in later this year or maybe in early of 2021. As you can, as you, you all know, the prevalence of stroke is much higher in Asia or Asia Pacific region. And given the close relation between the hypertension and the stroke, we may judge that Asian Pacific people are more vulnerable to hypertension. So a more aggressive hypertensive control approach should be adopted in this region. And in Taiwan, well, we achieved a significant reduction of stroke mortality in the past 30 to 40 years. As you can see here in the uh, age adjusted, adjusted mortality rate reduction of about 75%. That's a huge number. But even though the prevalence of stroke is still high in Taiwan, and even though we achieved such a great reduction in the uh, the adjusted stroke mortality rate, the recent published investigation of the whole Taiwan people, hypertensive people, we can still see the insufficiency in our management. The first one in four hypertensive people don't, uh, didn't know they got hypertension. And the overall control rate is, is about 50%. The 50% number is actually quite good compared to the rest of the world. However, for any chronic disease, we want to achieve 100% a control rate. So it's, there is a still a long way to go to achieve such a goal. So this fact reflects the importance of the implementation of a type of guideline. And then I will introduce you some key features of, of our published 2015 and 2017 guidelines. We published the first edition of Taiwan Hypertension Guideline in 2010. And five years later, we revised the guideline to issue the second edition of Taiwan Hypertension Guideline. And after the publication of the spring trial, which has a great impact on our daily clinical practice, so we published a focus update in 2017. And five years after 2015, in this year, we are now in preparation of the new Taiwan Hypertension Guideline. In our previous two versions of the guideline, two editions of the guideline, we want to make it more clinically useful. So we created algorithms, uh, three algorithms, and to make the cartoon figures uh, to facilitate its implementation. The first algorithm is called a diagnostic algorithm. In this algorithm, we emphasize the diagnosis of hypertension should be based on two-step confirm confirmation. So the first, it's not only solely depend on the office blood pressure. Once you got, uh, once uh, we measure the office blood pressure to be high, greater than 14090, we have to examine whether there's a presence of target organ damage. If there is a target organ damage, the pharmacological treatment should be initiated immediately. But if there's no evidence of target organ damage, and then we have to check either home blood pressure or ambulatory blood pressure, and to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. And the definition of home blood pressure for hypertension is 135.85, and the definition for ambulatory blood pressure is 130.80. So that's consistent with the uh, level recommended by the international guidelines. And the blood pressure targets, besides this, the rest of two algorithms that will introduce the blood pressure targets, we recommend the risk-based blood pressure targets, 140-90 for the general hypertensive patient and 130-80 millimeter mercury for high-risk hypertensive patient. The definitions of high risk include diabetes, chronic kidney disease with proteinuria, coronary heart disease, or patient taking anticoagulants 
or anti-thrombotic agents. So that's the two risk-based uh, blood pressure targets. And the second algorithm is about treatment algorithms. We also created some acronyms to facilitate memorizing. The first algorithm is called ACE-ABCDE that represents the six sectors of lifestyle modification. We also uh, create another uh, acronym called a PROCEED to include the seven sectors of the hypertension management. And uh, we separate the patient into high risk, the target 13080, and the general hypertensive 14090. We recommended the early and a fir first line use of single pill combination in patients with stage two hypertension, but not all hypertensive patients. And finally, the, the, the last algorithm is called adjustment algorithm because, because for any chronic disease, it's not only important in the initial assessment and the recommendation, but how to uh, evaluate the long-term management, the adjustment algorithm is very important. We created another uh, acronym called at goals here to represent the seven important uh, aspects of long-term management. The first A means adherence. If the patient has got poor adherence, maybe single pill combination could be used as a tool to improve the adherence. And the timing is also very important. We recommend to adjust the, the timing of the medication uh, based on the home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory monitoring. And the G means greater dose, O means other classes, a alternative means the different uh, adjustment of antihypertensive medications. And finally, the double L means the lifestyle modification should be emphasized continuously. And the serial assessment of laboratory findings, because that could reflect the, sever the, the severity of target organ damage, and that be closely related to the outcomes that be emphasized in our 2015 hypertension guidelines. So that's the uh, features of our old guidelines, and then what's new for our upcoming power hypertension guidelines. Basically, there are three new, five, new recommendations. The first is about the blood pressure targets. Blood pressure targets are always the, tar the hot topic of any uh, guidelines. But in the recent published American and the European guidelines, there's some difference in the blood pressure targets, of whether we should consider J-curve, and other aspects, we consider all the things, and, and I th we, we think that this figure can clearly demonstrate all the things we have to consider in recommending blood pressure targets. The first, the benefits of blood pressure reduction is directly proportional to the baseline risk rather than blood pressure severity. And as you can see, see here, and the, the so-called J-curve or the hybrid or risk associated with too aggressive blood pressure reduction actually is related to the severity of blood pressure. So for a patient with much higher blood pressure, if we set the same goal, the blood pressure reduction will be much greater in those with a higher baseline blood pressure in therefore the greater possible side effects. So if we consider these two important principles, we can construct such a risk and grade-based blood pressure targets we make this figure more clinically oriented or useful. We separate it based on the stage and the grade in the proper target into two targets. For those with a higher baseline risk, no matter how severity the blood pressure hypertension is, we suggest a 12580 targets. Well, this target is a bit lower than the 13080 because the recent meta-analysis de meta -analysis demonstrated that the blood pressure reduction down to below 125 is associated with a, the mortality reduction. And for those with uh, even higher blood pressure, but if their baseline risk is not so high, we recommend 14090, uh, 14090 targets. Well, these are based on the hope free spring post hoc analysis and all the other meta analysis. So that's the first new recommendation in our Taiwan hypertension guideline. We constructed risk and grade based PV targets. And the second, we extend, expand our initial recommendation for the first line or early use of single pill combination to all hypertensive patients, which are recommended also in all the international or regional guidelines recently published. And the final, we constructed the management 
or, or follow-up assessment algorithm. We first define the goal attainment uh, have to fulfill the three criteria. The first is about always blood pressure for sure. And the second, home blood pressure or ambulatory blood pressure should be considered as a criteria uh, for the goal attainment. And finally, the target organ damage, because this is the single factor that mostly closely related to outcomes. And the target organ damage or the severity of the target organ damage or hypertension media organ damage should be remain stable or even reverse, that could be defined as the goal attainment. So if we define the goal attainment, the definition of goal attainment should be based on the fulfillment of all these three criteria. And we also emphasize the importance of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. We put the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring into this algorithm, and we recommend the ambulatory monitoring, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring should be performed in the following two conditions. The first is the presence of white cohabitation, and the second is the persistent or progressive organ damage. If the organ damage cannot be reverted, uh, we have to examine the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So these are the three new findings in our upcoming hypertension guideline. So in summary, uh, there are four points. The first, given the benefits of blood pressure lowering directly proportional to the baseline risk rather than the severity of blood pressure. So an integrated hypertension stage and a grade-based blood pressure target strategy being, uh, being recommended in our upcoming guideline. And the initial single pill combination therapy will, uh, uh, will be recommended for all hypertensive patients. And the role of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring will be emphasized and clearly delineated in the algorithm to facilitate its clinical adoption. And finally, either home or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or hypertension media organ damage guided a treatment strategy will be developed in our upcoming hypertension guidelines. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Wan. Um, actually, he is not present today, but uh, uh, we enjoyed uh, his presentation. Uh, the, we cannot discuss, but uh, uh, could you have, uh, give us some comment uh, about the Taiwan hypertension guideline, uh, Professor Park? I I I I agree with the that you have to uh uh different uh categorize different target blood pressure according to the risk, but um I'm not sure why what the the number 125 came from. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I don't know where 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 the evidence is that uh the the blood pressure be, should be lowered below 125. I think mm -hmm. they're basing it on the the blood pressure achieved blood pressure level from the, the sprint study, but the sprint study actually used the AOBP method. And I don't think you yeah. can uh, generalize the results from the sprint study to yeah. the uh, usual office blood pressure. So yes. uh, there's yeah. some question with the target blood pressure. Oh yeah, uh, next time we will ask him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Professor Oishi, do you have any comments on I have the same question. So because and the one twenty is very very strict. <laughs> so I have a question. Yeah. Okay. So the, yeah, Professor one has some problem uh, for connection. Uh, still on and off is his condition. So we could we close this session at this time uh, and. Please enjoy the, the Professor Wang presentation by On Demand later. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Professor Park, uh, Professor Thank Oishi. Thank you very much. I would close the meeting by thanking all the speakers from uh, several countries in Asia, all participants of the meeting, and my co-chair, Professor Hasebei. I should also thank the organizers of the meeting for their strong technical support, which uh, allows us to uh, communicate uh, in uh, this uh, virtual online meeting. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs>